We must move to questions uh, to the Minister for Health and Social Services and Public Safety. I call Ms Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm disappointed that the number of patients referred as urgent by their GPs with a suspected cancer receive their first treatment within six, who receive their first treatment within 61 days remains below the ministerial target of 95 per cent. Recent performances have been 70.1 per cent in October 2014, 74.1 per cent in November, 74.7 per cent in December. The majority of those patients waiting beyond the 62 days are waiting within the urology specialty. Urology services across Northern Ireland remain challenging, and the Health and Social Care Board is leading a service improvement initiative across all trusts to improve this position. Ms. Dobson, for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And I note what the Minister has said, but the minor improvements in no way excuse the totally unacceptable situation that still persists, not least considering the vast majority of people who are treated on, on time or not treated in time are later diagnosed as having cancer. So does the Minister think it is an acceptable situation for either the patients as the disease spreads freely through their bodies? or for their families who are forced, by, forced to sit by and helplessly watch. I remind the member that uh, questions should be asked and not read out. Um, a short answer to the honourable member for Upper Ban is no, I don't think it's, it's acceptable. I think there is massive room for improvement and indeed the board has set challenging targets for the trusts to meet in the incoming year. I would emphasise, however, there are two targets, the 62 target day target and also the 31 day standard which is the, the time between diagnosis and first treatment and in fact in that particular target the trusts are doing exceptionally well. The most recent figures I have for instance are Belfast 91 per cent, the northern 100 per cent, the south eastern 97.6 per cent and the southern 100 per cent and that's up to February 2015. The latest figure I have for the western trust is up to December 2014 and again it's 100 per cent. So clearly, once a diagnosis is made, uh, the clinicians are very quick to organise and to deliver treatment. The problem is, is between the earlier uh, re reference from a, a GP for diagnosis that there seems to be the delay. Some of these issues are outside my control. There is a shortage of urologists throughout the United Kingdom. And at the moment, we have vacancies in the Northern Trust and in the Belfast Trust, and they are proving very difficult to fill. And obviously, in the absence of those uh, clinic clinicians, it is very difficult to deliver a service. But I do accept on the longer 62-day target, there is room for improvement, and we're determined to deliver that. Gary, I'll get a brief last game caller, and I thank the Minister for that update. But can I ask specifically, given the recent statistics from Macmillan, that survival rates in the north in terms of lung cancer, breast, colon and, and stomach cancer are actually lagging behind some other European countries by as much as 10 years, what the strategy or plan might be to tackle that stark statistic? It's worth saying that as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, for some cancers we're achieving remarkable outcomes. For childhood leukaemia, prostate and breast cancer, survival ship is now way beyond 80 per cent, which shows that we've made quite remarkable uh, advancements in the treatment of those cancers. And indeed, uh, uh, taken as a whole, Northern Ireland can hold its head up when it comes to overall survival, survival rates. But I accept that for conditions such as lung cancer, uh, pancreatic, ovarian, we are still uh, way behind where we want to be. The rates that we have are similar to those of the rest of the United Kingdom. I do accept in other countries, where, which is Sweden, Norway and Denmark, where there are far more resources available for can cancer treatment, with commensurate much higher taxes, I have to say, then the outcomes are better. And we need to learn from their experiences. But certainly we are moving in the right direction as far as cancer treatment is concerned. But the one issue that I don't have control over, and, and that's uh, staffing. If the staff are simply not there, if the qualified urologists or, or oncologists are simply not available for recruitment, then it makes life very difficult for the trusts to, to meet their targets. And this, uh, workforce planning, I'm afraid, is going to become a more and more dominant issue in health. I think we have 11 workforce reviews on at the moment. And almost at every level in the health service at the moment, we are facing 
workforce pressures. The, the tide has turned inexorably in that particular area, and we have problems ahead. This isn't money. I must make it absolutely clear. We have the money to employ these specialists. We simply can't get them at the moment. Mr. Fergal McKinnon. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister too for his answers thus far. Could the Minister give a commitment similar to the approach taken in Scotland that he could relax the exceptionality criteria in the IFR process uh, while the consultation period continues and it's adjudicated on to allow life, uh, access to life-extending drugs? I think that's a fairly valid comment. What I can say, if he uh, reads the statement I made very carefully, on the IFR report. Implicit in that is a very significant increase in the amount of funding for cancer drugs. I think it's a trebling of the amount. So clearly that presupposes and assumes that the new two committee system that we're setting up will have a much more flexible approach to requests, IFR requests for individual cancer drugs. So therefore we are determined to deliver upon that even in terribly difficult financial situations. But remember, that will not greatly improve survival rates. The vast majority of these drugs enhance and extend life. Very few of them save life. So uh, the, the, the comments that, that, that Mrs. Dobson has made will not be solved by a more flexible IFR uh, strategy. But it will help those who have got a terminal diagnosis to live out their, their lives on an extended basis and more comfortable. And that, of course, is a very, very valuable role that these drugs perform. But still, the overall figures show that Northern Ireland, particularly through the Belfast Cancer Centre, has achieved so much uh, in a very short period, and that's to be welcomed. So we, we shouldn't beat ourselves up on this issue. We are doing well. Palm Com. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, the Minister has already mentioned that urology is uh, a major part of the problem here. Can he outline what actions are being taken to make improvements within this field? The main pressure points are in the Northern and the South East Trusts, and I am expecting both to take urgent action to reduce the length of time that patients are waiting on the urological pathway. Uh, this will involve moving urology services temporarily to the Western Trust until the issues in the Northern Trust have been resolved. As a result of this action, the number of patients waiting longer than 62 days on the urology pathway in the Northern Trust has been reduced from 140 in August 2000. 2014 to 7 in the provisional reporting that the board has issued at the end of February 2015. And can I say, I, I was recently up with uh, Minister Radcher, the Irish uh, Health Minister, last week to Londonderry, where we inspected progress in the new radiotherapy unit, which is being built at a cost, I think, of £69 million, partially funded by the HSC and the Irish Republic. And once that's up and running, in the autumn of 2016, this will provide new capacity for radiotherapy, not only for, for, for Northern and Western Trust patients, but also those from Donegal, but also will relieve the pressure on the Belfast Cancer Centre. And therefore, we should see a general improvement in treatment throughout Northern Ireland. And I was delighted to hear last week, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, it was up Wednesday, that uh, progress is on, on time, and that will interest the chair of the committee, that the building will be state-of-the-art and indeed it will be the most modern radiotherapy centre on the island of Ireland and we think within the United Kingdom. So therefore the people of the North West are going to get a marvellous new facility which will help in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer to over 450,000 people. I have to remind members that question number 11 has been withdrawn and I call Mr uh, Tom Buchanan. Question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have invited representatives of the Grand Lodge of Ireland and the Confederation of Ulster Bands to meet the, with the Public Health Agency and myself to discuss how public health messages can be disseminated to their members. I also met with Cancer Focus Northern Ireland to discuss their initiatives to improve community health, including their work with the Orange Order. Mr. Buchanan, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, member, or the Minister for his, um, his response. But can the Minister outline what particular conditions that he envisages that progress can be made with? The, the meeting with the Orange Order and the PHA will provide an opportunity to discuss how we can raise awareness around a number of health issues. And of course, the vast majority of those who participate in Orange Order parades and in band parades are 
basically male and often young male. So we're looking at issues such as heart disease, strokes, diabetes, obesity, physical activity, alcohol problems and of course the promotion of smoking cessation. Um, we know that men are four times less likely to visit their GP than women and often men find that by the time they do report with the condition it's too late, it has progressed. So therefore we feel it's important to get out into the community and to speak, particularly to young men, to emphasise the importance of giving up smoking, drinking sensibly and more importantly now, uh, reducing skin cancer which is now the most prevalent form of cancer in Northern Ireland. And therefore, people who tend to be out in the sun a lot need to be very careful, be they marching or be they simply out enjoying the countryside, that they take pr pr protective measures. So therefore, I was very enthusiastic uh, about the uh, Cancer Focus NI initiative, going out into the community, not just orange and bands, but also, for instance, going out and reaching the farming community. Particularly, male farmers tend to be very loath to report a problem to their GP. And it was interesting to notice that through these visits, for instance, they were in the 13th field at uh, Scarva, the Siam fight at Scarva, and in the 12th at Market Hill, they were picking up uh, conditions amongst those members of the Orange and the bands and their families, which would have been missed had the, had the what's called the man van not been out in the field. I also understand that they're uh, exploring this initiative for the GAA. And this is an excellent opportunity of taking health uh, provision to the community and identifying conditions which would, up to that point, would, would have been missed totally. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'm interested in the Minister's comments. Minister, I wonder could you explain why there's effectively a postcode lottery for people across Northern Ireland who, in fact, would be um, diagnosed with things like skin cancer? Depends where they live. I actually would be very interested in evidence of that because what we have done in Northern Ireland, I think, has taken the very sensible step of uh, centralising acute cancer services into the Belfast City, Belfast Hospital, Belfast City Cancer Centre. And that has led to a concentration of resources and skilled clinicians, consultants, etc., in the one building. Now, we've had experience of that for about 10 years, and I must say all the evidence would indicate that has been the right way forward. So someone in a trust who, who has been diagnosed with a serious cancer should be referred to that service uh, without any difficulty with a postcode. Uh, and there's no real evidence to indicate that um, people are being turned away because they happen to live beyond Glengormley or carried off or whatever. So therefore, particularly from the South East Trust, uh, the, the problem is, is in the South East Trust is a lack of urolog urological consultants. But once the uh, diagnosis has been made, the South East Trust is meeting its target, I think it's 97%, I quoted earlier, of patients then who are, who are treated within the 31-day period. So I'd be very interested in any evidence you could give me of that happening. But clearly, the, the evidence, is, from, from my point of view, is that we are marching, moving forward to a healthier society with many fewer of our citizens dying from cancer as a result of this work. And as I said this, and I keep mentioning it because good news doesn't travel very fast out of this building, I've noticed. But last year, for the first time ever in Northern Ireland, there are more people alive with cancer in 10 years than have passed on. That's a very, very important, almost a Rubicon that we've crossed, that for the first time ever, there's more people alive than have died. Uh, and therefore, cancer is rapidly becoming a long-term condition rather than an acute uh, condition that leads ultimately to, to fatalities. So therefore, we need to keep that going, and we're doing well. But the, uh, the, the member for Upper Ban has indeed highlighted an issue which has caused me concern, and I'm worried about what you, what's been said. We need to tighten up on the 62-day target, and we owe that to the people of Northern Ireland because I know what a worrying period that 62 days is for many people, and we have to try and bring it down to a more manageable level. Remind the Minister about the two-minute rule. <laughs> Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister um, that uh, he now acknowledges the high importance of the work of the Public Health Agency. Will the Minister reconsider the reduction, the vast, huge reduction in their budget by 15 per cent that, that will make them not able to provide the service that they have here to four? Mr. Principal, let me speak. We've moved a long way from the 12th field at Market Hill, but uh, assuming that this is still relevant to, to the question, the 15% uh, efficiency saving within the PHA is an administration. Need to emphasise that. 
We have targeted administration as the way that we can take, uh, make savings within the health service without affecting frontline care. And we've examined very carefully the, the savings proposed by the, the PHA, and we believe they are achievable in a way that does not cause difficulties to the essential work which we all recognise that the PHA is carrying out. It will be a stretching target, and I accept that. But still, many of the programmes that the PHA have been uh, rolling out throughout the province will remain intact despite the, the huge difficulties we're in as far as funding is concerned. My department is at the final stages of reviewing the business case for the replacement of the Oak Ridge Social Education Centre in Dungannon. Due to the current financial constraints, there are a number of projects under consideration like this one, that cannot currently be progressed as no funding is available to take them forward. The timeline for completion will therefore be dependent on appropriate business case approvals and ultimately budget availability. Well, Ms. McGoughan, for supplementary. Gourmet, and I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, I am sure you would, ag would acknowledge that there is a need for a new facility in the Dungannon area for those with learning disabilities, and I would encourage you to visit Oak Ridge and Dungannon to see it for yourself. Can I ask the Minister, will he commit to providing a new and enhanced modern facilities for those with disabilities in the Dungannon area? Well, I have promised the member and Lord Morrow that I'm going to visit Lone House in Dungannon, so I could easily combine a visit to Oak Bridge with that. And I am sure now that she reminded me, my dairy secretary will be beavering away to ensure that that happens. Um, this project is going to cost a capital of amount of £3.5 million. The situation is for next year is I have an entire capital budget of about £203 million. By the time you take in all of what I've committed to, and the predecessor, Mr. Putz, and indeed Mr. Majimsey, committed themselves to, that leaves us with next to no money for any new initiative. I think it's important that we just do emphasise what we, have, we will be spending money on in 15-16. I've already mentioned the new radiotherapy block in Elton Gelvin. We're also doing a new North Wing in the same hospital, new Ulster Hospital General Ward and Acute Services block, and that's costing us £210 million. OMA Local Hospital, which will benefit some of uh, the ladies' constituents, new health and social care, uh, care centres in Ballymena and Banbridge, the new Children's hus Hospital, uh, which of course will be in the RV8 site, and paediatric services within uh, Daisy Hill and Craigavon. So we are trying to squeeze as much as we can out of that. But we really, in the absence of something happening post-general election or some great success we have in the monitoring round, it is very difficult to see how I can commit myself to this sort of funding. Now, the member will say, of course, but it's only £3.5 million on a £203 million budget. But I am sure within this room, this chamber, there is at least a dozen or 15 other similar projects. And as I can see on this one, no doubt they'll be in to see me uh, demanding similar treatment. I had a group in the other day from Cross McGlen uh, demanding similar provision down in that area. And both made the point, as you have, that the present facilities are very, very poor, and I accept that. But the present budget does not give me much in the way of uh, funding. Now, this is within the Southern Trust, and there's a, a large range of schemes already have been committed in the Southern Trust. Since we're putting £16 million into the, uh, the, the healthcare hub in Banbridge, £11 million into Craig Avon for um, uh, rewiring, and a new paediatric unit in Craig Avon, and a new scanner in Craig Avon. Can I ask uh, Paula Bradley, can I remind the member that this is a very specific question to a constituency? Okay. Move on then to a call, Mr. George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question four. The uh, Ministerial Coordination Group on Suicide Prevention has helped ensure improved cross-departmental engagement in addressing suicide. Uh, Cross-departmental work, work has taken place through sporting organisations, rural networks, uh, justice, justice settings, libraries and schools. The last group met last week on the 16th of April, I chaired that meeting, and it uh, reconsidered the first draft of the frontline intervention section of the new suicide prevention strategy, which is currently in development. Call Mr Robinson for supplementary. Thank the Minister. His answer. <clears throat> Will the Minister outline some examples of actions being implemented by other executive departments? I have to say I found that 
a very useful meeting last week. That's not because I chaired it. Um, it was last Thursday. Um, I thought there was buy-in from all of the executives. I think that was uh, shown by, for instance, that Minister Durkin, uh, Minister Storey, uh, uh, Min Minister McCann were all present, and if other departments weren't represented by ministers, there was a very high part of a group of officials who came along. And I thought it was working well together. The main work of the group is to refresh the Protect Life strategy, which was rolled out uh, and, and uh, over the last two years is being updated. Now, the good news it would indicate that the number of suicides in Northern Ireland has dropped from about 303 in 2013 to a provisional uh, estimate of just over 280 for 2014. And that's despite a situation in other uh, Western, parts of Western Europe where the numbers have inexorably grown. So we believe that the strategy is working. Uh, and therefore, I feel that the various activities being carried out by the departments have been successful, but we cannot be complacent because 280, I think it's 286 uh, suicides has a huge devastating impact on a society the size of Northern Ireland. It is reckoned in the province that every suicide affects directly 60 people because of the close-knit society that we have. So therefore, I am pleased that at least we seem to be getting uh, some progress in this very difficult issue. Could I also say that the Lifeline uh, initiative has had uh, 655,000 callers in the last year up to February 2015, uh, which has uh, required interventions with 13 per cent of callers. It is handling 2,244 calls per week. and We are putting a total of 7 million into the budget for suicide, and almost half of it goes into Lifeline. And at least there is some encouragement that, that these policies are beginning to work. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers um, thus far. And Naira, can play a tajent to Egi Leshawakasal, Sajeshkart, Majula Kurhegi, Egdilai Le Fian Waru, August Clark Fasak de Fian Waru, a Kurhan Kin? Can I ask the Minister what discussions, if any, he has had with his counterpart in the South in relation to uh, tackling suicide and also the promotion of suicide awareness programmes? I had a very useful meeting with the Health Minister of the Irish Republic uh, last Wednesday in Londonderry in Alt McGelvin Hospital. And I must say, we found ourselves singing from the very, all, both from the same hymn sheet on this issue. Both jurisdictions are bringing forward strategies to deal with suicide. We are at different stages in the process. And what we agreed at that meeting was that there was little merit in having a joint all-island strategy, but there was huge merit in officials from both jurisdictions getting together on a regular basis to share best practice uh, on this very, very important issue. We identified that on both sides of the border, the, 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 the particularly difficult area is males between 15 and 50 particularly unemployed males from social and economic disadvantaged areas, and the important role, unfortunately, that alcohol played in suicides. And therefore, both jurisdictions agreed that that was the core area that we need to analyse in particular, and we're going to work together to see what is best practice in both the Republic and Northern Ireland. Call Mr Michael Majemsey. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, and can I ask the Minister that, bearing in mind in the past the important role that internet and internet chat lines have had uh, in terms of promoting uh, suicide, uh, how effective does he believe the Barron report and the Barron uh, task force has been in actually bringing these uh, providers into some sort of social responsibility to help us uh, press down on what is this, one of the, the scourges of our society? The members asked a very, very useful question. Indeed, if it wasn't one of my own backbenches, you would say it's a plant, but it's not. It's something that I think is incredibly important because the, the growth area, unfortunately, as far as danger to our young children, is in the internet and the, and the electronic media. 
And there are some extremely worrying developments. There was a recent uh, BBC Spotlight programme that showed that several hundred yo young girls had their Facebook images taken and used for pornographic images. There was a report recently that shows a high proportion of eight-year-old boys have been exposed to sadistic pornography at the age of eight, which I think is absolutely appalling. And issues which are totally unheard of when many in this chamber were young are now rampant. And that's why I welcome strongly the fact that the entire executive, and this is unusual, the entire executive has agreed to jointly fund a, a strategy on this issue. Uh, and the money, I think it's £80,000, has been made available. And we're going to develop a strategy for Northern Ireland. I'd like to hope, without preempting that, that there will be a situation arise that this hardcore material and bullying and all of the associated risks to our young people will be automatically blocked unless an adult registers to opt into it. I simply cannot understand why the big uh, multinational internet service providers allow our young people to have unlimited free access to material which is totally unsuitable and desperately damaging to their emotional and physical welfare. And I, I'd like to think that the lead that some internet providers like Sky have already adopted will be brought in for all the companies. If someone wants to access this material, well, that's up to them. But they need to register for it, and that needs to have a blocking mechanism that no one under 18 can see it. Call Mr. John Dow. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, welcome the, the Minister's answer so far. Uh, obviously, the subject under discussion is a very serious one, and we welcome the reduction on suicides. Would the Minister agree with me that early intervention for those people who find themselves in this situation is absolutely critical? And would he also agree that uh, though the best practice where it exists uh, should be more widely known? For example, in the Hollywell Hospital at uh, Antrim, there is best practice at the uh, at Robeson Hospital in Balamoney, there's best practice, but perhaps not enough people have access to those wonderful facilities where people go out literally into the homes of people who are at risk and help them and, bear, and indeed save their lives. I, I recently attended a meeting uh, in Grantia with the Western Trust, and it's quite clear the Western Trust are taking the lead on this issue. And it does worry me slightly that as you go around Northern Ireland, you see little pockets of excellence being carried out by various trusts, but not much evidence of that being shared with the rest of Northern Ireland. Now, one of the things that the Western Trust told me is that 72% of those who commit suicide in Northern Ireland are totally unknown to the health and social care system. So it shows you how difficult it can be to identify those who have this uh, uh, mental issues which can lead to suicide. What's even more worrying is that over 40% of those who subsequently committed suicide had presented to A&E and hadn't been picked up as suicidal during that visit. And the Western Trust were concentrating on that issue. Another issue that I'd like to congratulate the Western Trust is that the majority of those who commit suicide in, in the London Derry area do so in the river. And they're taking action, for instance, putting up cameras uh, at the appropriate spots to identify those who perhaps are considering a suicide and making those bridges, and it really is the bridges that are concerned, concerning, to make them more uh, informative, giving warning to those who would be considering taking such drastic action. Because Foil Search and Rescue have told me that the vast majority of people that they rescue haven't slipped into the river. They have jumped into the river and therefore are contemplating suicide. So therefore, he's right. There are examples of good practice. He's mentioned the Robinson as well. And I think we need to disseminate this throughout Northern Ireland because we still are losing far, far too many people to this awful situation. Well, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Kesht Ivarakouig, question number five. It's disappointing that some sleep clinic patients are waiting longer for appointments. This is a particular problem in the regional services provided by the Belfast Trust. Again, that's due to staffing issues. The Health and Social Care Board is working with the Belfast Trust to expedite the transition of sleep clinic services to other trusts to help waiting times. The Belfast Trust is also making every effort to cover the workload until the staffing issues are resolved, for example, by obtaining additional limited capacity in Edinburgh. 
Thank you. And Gawn Bwekus Danara Dan Fragr Shin, I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. I wonder could he detail um, the numbers waiting and what action plan he has um, in relation to this serious matter? I haven't the exact details waiting. We would have to obtain that from the uh, five trusts, but I'm more than happy to write to her with specific details and also to provide a bit more update because I think we're running out of time here as to what we're doing to improve this service, particularly with the link to Edinburgh and trying to take the load off the Belfast Trust. But I would say once again we're in a situation where there's only a very finite number of experts at consultant level on this issue and we're finding it very hard to recruit and I'm afraid that will be an issue that's going to come back time and time again. The fact that the labour market and health is tightening rapidly. And from nursing to middle grade doctors to consultants, we are finding it very, very hard uh, to uh, recruit the necessary uh, staff. I could say about you, uh, that at the end of February 2015, there was a total of 555 patients who were waiting for a diagnostic sleep study, and 128 of those have been waiting nine weeks. Uh, 127 patients are waiting over nine weeks in Belfast and one in the South East Trust. I will expand upon those figures and send her full details. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions and I call Mr Ian Millen. Good day, last one, Collier. Uh, Minister, you would be aware that there is a lack of uh, post-mortem uh, services at the weekend and on bank holidays. Uh, could you give the House an indication of how many families have been adversely impacted? Upon by this, the, the Reverend William McRae, the MP for South Antrim, has raised this issue with particular reference to Antrim Area Hospital and the distress that this can cause families. I, I, without prior notice, I couldn't give him the figures, but Mr McRae's approach did prompt me uh, to, to make a mental note to investigate this issue uh, because it seems to be a fact, an effective uh, problem throughout. Northern Ireland apart from the Belfast, major Belfast hospitals. So we will be investigating this issue and see what can be done to help families in this very distressing situation. Call Mr Millen for supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his, uh, for his answer thus far and uh, appreciate the, that this here does not just affect the, my own constituency, it happens right across the whole of the North. Uh, and it is also reassuring to hear the Minister stating that he is going to take a, a look at this here and I would ask that this, if there is a review needed that is done as quickly as possible because of the stress that it causes on to the families concerned. Yes, yeah, yeah, so I, will, I will look at this. Uh, the Reverend McRae gave me uh, information on a very distressing incident that he was involved in from a family from Maherfeld, uh, and the fact that no one could give any definitive answer to the family. Unfortunately, the deceased passed away at the weekend, and there seemed to be a hiatus before anything could be done to assist them. And I suspect that that issue, which I think was even raised in the local media in Ulster, is the one he's referring to. Um, of course, you have to balance that with the fact that is that are you keeping staff working over the weekend when there may be very few cases to deal with. But I think, having heard from the Reverend McRae the huge hurt that that particular issue caused, I think it's something we should investigate, and I will do that. It will not be a formal review, but it will be a departmental look at where we're going. This remember, of course, that we don't have direct control of all of these issues, but we will certainly look at it. Mr. Pachi. I've got a free last concorda. Uh, the minister recently uh, said that he was working on guidelines on the termination of pregnancy and that he hoped to have them before the executive within a few weeks. Uh, that was more than five weeks ago. Could the minister tell us where that currently sits? This is an incredibly difficult and complex issue, as he'll understand, because it's inevitable that whatever I decide will be judicially reviewed. If the guidelines are perceived by some as being too weak, uh, those who are campaigning in the pro-life uh, movement will judicially review them. If they're seen as being uh, too strong, in other words, seen to be too pro-life, inevitably those in the charitable and NGO sector in what's called the pro-choice lobby will judicially review them. And therefore, it's very, very difficult. And indeed, we have been trying to deal with this issue for, I think, nine years. And each time, obstacles arise because it's such a difficult moral issue that many, many people in Northern Ireland and their public representatives feel exceptionally strongly about. 
But as far as the timeline is concerned, we are coming very close to a situation where we will be able to refer those to the executive uh, and for, for, for discussion. But I can assure them that will not be the last of it, because we know from experience in this House how frequently our constituents and lobby groups go, go to the courts. And therefore, I would be very, very surprised if this issue is resolved permanently within the year. Well, Mr. Sheehan, for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. But would he accept that delay in this issue is putting uh, pressure on all people concerned, not least health professionals? Yes, but, but, but getting this wrong won't help the health professionals. If I issue a document that is immediately referred up to, to the High Court and uh, leads to long and turgid uh, judicial review, then we still have a lack of clarity as far as uh, the clinicians are concerned. And we have all vast experience in this chamber of legislation which has been referred to judicial review and it has sat for, for years and years before it has been actually agreed uh, the way forward. So I, I, I'll be honest with you, I think this is the most difficult issue that I have on my table at the moment uh, in terms of, of, of reaching a consensus that I feel will be deliverable within the community. Uh, it's one I've spent a huge amount of time on and, and one I would prefer to see resolved. But I have to say, I can't see that happening in my time as Minister of Health and probably not in my successors. Question number three has been withdrawn. I call Mr Chris Lowe. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, given that we have around 7,000 people with dementia in Northern Ireland who don't have a diagnosis, a quarter of people diagnosed with no information of support and around 90 per cent feeling that support they receive is inadequate, can I ask the Minister how he intends to support the Alzheimer's Society Right to Know campaign? I am supportive of the Alzheimer's Right to Know campaign and I work closely with, with the, uh, the charity in that field. We have to understand that whilst the percentage of people with Alzheimer's is falling, the overall numbers are rising dramatically because we're in an ageing society. And that is putting tremendous pressure on the clinicians because there's a greater awareness of Alzheimer's, which is also combined with larger numbers. And therefore, uh, it's still a, a real challenge. But Northern Ireland has actually comm been commended as the best region in the United Kingdom for making an early diagnosis of dementia. So we, we have, we're getting it right to some extent. I have to set aside £35 million every year in the health service budget simply to take account that we're an ageing society. And therefore, that gives you an indication of the pressure I'm, I'm under. So we, we are making some progress. I, I hear regularly of reports in the media of some breakthrough cure uh, or diagnosis for Alzheimer's. And I really hope it's successful because the fact is, at the moment, there is no quick fix for this awful condition. That is progressive and it causes huge difficulties to sufferers and families. Nothing would make me happier to introduce some form of uh, medicine which would lead to a curtailment of the progression of the, of the condition or even better. So we are doing our best in very difficult conditions, but I think we can stand up proudly with the rest of the United Kingdom in what we have achieved. But is that enough at the moment? No, it is becoming a more and more difficult issue as the years progress. Well, Mr Little, for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his uh, response and for his support for the Right to Know campaign. Can I ask the Minister, uh, in his assessment, how far we are away from the, achieving the key targets of the campaign that are a diagnosis for everyone with dementia? Uh, no longer than 12-week wait between first appointment with the GP and diagnosis and a dementia support worker or equivalent for everyone at the point of diagnosis? That is the aspirations of the Right to Know campaign. It is not based on any uh, clinical recommendations from, from those directly involved. I think one of the reasons for that is that that is extremely challenging, uh, to have a, a guaranteed uh, wait of only 12 weeks, uh, a guaranteed uh, nurse practitioner looking after the patient is terribly demanding in the present economic situation. And when I reveal the budget for 15-16, I have to say there will be a lot of pain for a lot of uh, parts of Northern Ireland when it's published. A lot of concern expressed about reduction in services, yet maintaining uh, the high standard of clinical care we have. 
Uh, I don't think we're in a position yet to deliver the right to know, which could be said to be legitimate demands. But we will continue to ensure that the people of Northern Ireland who have suspected uh, Alzheimer's are diagnosed as quickly as possible and giving the best, best care pathway in what is a very challenging economic environment. I call Mr. David McNary. Principal Deputy Speaker, it's very interesting to hear the Speaker mention uh, this forthcoming budget that he's going to reveal. Could I ask him what salary increases um, were Northern Ireland senior health staff uh, paid in the past two years? Well, well, actually, our senior health staff have had pay reductions because of the increase in their pension contributions. Um, and I know it is quite easy to criticise our chief executives and directors. The problem is, and he's have to face up to this, we have lost three very capable senior executives in the Health Trust recently to England, who are offering packages way in excess of anything that we are allowed to under the guidelines issued by DFP. And I'm particularly annoyed about the losing of one particular individual who everybody in this House accepted was absolutely outstanding. So therefore, if we're going to retain the best talent in Northern Ireland, we have to look at paying conditions. And I know it's going to be unpopular if I suggest that they should be paid the going salary for the, 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 crucially, important, uh, the, the, the crucially important work that they do. But I'm flagging that up as an issue that's going to arise in the future and one that I am particularly worried about. Uh, they all have contracts, and uh, they're, they're, under the contracts, they are permitted uh, statutory uh, pay increases. They have been very modest, I can assure you, and taken into account increases in their pay, pension contributions. Uh, all of them, as far as I am aware of, have taken a pay cut. Now, there are two exceptions to that, because there are two chief executives in the Trust who are also qualified consultants, and they are on a different pay scale to the non-consultants. And that's why it may seem that their pay is quite high. But remember, if they were out in consultancy work with some private uh, add-ons to that, they would be receiving a very high standard. But what I can say to you is, I believe we now have in place a very, very strong team of chief executives and directors at all levels within the Health Trust. And we've seen some quite remarkable turnarounds and improvement from performances throughout the service in Northern Ireland. And one of my roles is to try and keep that team together as long as possible. And that's going to be very difficult, given what I'm seeing happening in England, where the that talent is recognised, both in terms of the, st the status and in terms of pay. Call Mr McNary for supplementary. Uh, I'm not criticising anyone, Deputy Principal Speaker, least of all the Minister. In fact, I would join with him in um, the encouragement that he's given to the talent and the people we have. But following the revelations in England that some uh, health executives uh, earned more than a million pounds last year, and directors, in fact, uh, were getting packages up to 5,000 a day. In light of what he said, um, what increase in terms of competing has he in mind to pay over the next two years to fit the category he's just told this House? We, we are having a look at that, but can I assure you we're never going to reach the situation where anyone in Northern Ireland is paid anything like that sort of amount of money. But what I can say to you is that some of our top staff, in terms of their delivery, in terms of the better and efficient management of their trusts, and some of them are in charge of six, a budget of 600, 700 million indeed in the Belfast Trust over a billion pounds, that a good, a good chief executive, a good director can save more than their salary through a more efficient delivery of uh, the health care provision. And Liam Donaldson, his report, said very clearly, we need to recognise that talent. Because it's not just me that's recognising it. If various chief, exec chief uh, chairmen from various trusts throughout England are eyeing up Northern Ireland for potential transfer deals, if I could put it that way, that tells me we do have some very capable and special staff in Northern Ireland. And, what I, may, and I should flag up one other issue. Many English trusts are moving to a joint health and social care provision. Up to now, that they've been split. Where is the only place in the United Kingdom that they can get good, experienced staff with skills in both health and social care? It's in Northern Ireland. And therefore, we have to watch out that there are, there are not more uh, staff being lured across to Southern England. So therefore, I, I think we, we need to look at this. But of course, any change would need to be fit in with the broader Northern Ireland public sector pay. 
uh, and with, with approval of DFP. So it's a difficult issue, but I don't think at the moment our top staff are being recognised uh, sufficiently. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, in terms of extra funds for GP services, can I ask you what specifically are you going to do as Health Minister to enhance out of hours services in Kilkeel so that it becomes a model for rural, rural health care right across the north? And I'm thinking specifically of, of, of two things. When you talked about there's a lot of pain, well, I had one constituent who had a lot of pain once on at the weekend and they were told to ring back on Monday. So what did that parents, what did the relative do? They rang emergency, got the ambulance and so on. And then the other one, to create a bit of flexibility around doctor, doctor appointments. Many people leave Kilkeel, the working people leave Kilkeel at half six in the morning. They have no Can access to, to appointments. To to they have no access to appointments, you know what I mean? Uh, the, the point is well made by the member for South Down, and indeed that's the reason why uh, 10 days ago I announced an extra £15 million funding for GP services, including £3.1 million additional money, monies for out-of-hours provision. The BMA and the Royal College of General Surgeons, our general practitioners, have been lobbying the department and myself on this. Indeed, on Thursday night, I was at a meeting with BMA where this issue arose again. I have seen the rotas for Kilkeel, and it's a particularly difficult area where there are large gaps throughout this month and, and, and further afield. And I can see the problems we're having, and that's many MLAs throughout the country, particularly in rural areas, have mentioned this problem to me. We're hoping the extra 3.1 million will enable us to employ locums to cover in difficult areas. Because in Kilkeel, as he knows, the options are very limited. You either go to Newry, or to Downpatrick, or, 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 or to Craigavon, or wherever. It's a long distance to, the, to other cover. And therefore, I think it's an important area that we, we do plug the gaps in Kilkeel. But as he knows, this has been going on since last May. And in July in particular, there were long shifts around the 12th fortnight where we had no cover because there weren't staff available to do it. And um, I, that's why I'm hoping the £3.1 million will have some impact in the overall performance in Northern Ireland, because I don't want them going to a and &E in Daisy Hill or, or the Down, uh, because on many occasions that's not what's required. So we're simply storing up trouble down the road, as it were, and we need to improve out of ours throughout rural parts of Northern Ireland. Time is up. That concludes question time. I invite the members to take their ease while we change the top table.